As of November 21st, 2023, I've seen all there is to consume of the Project ACO franchise. This is the first movie and the OVAs. Today we'll be covering all entries of the anime, starting with the original back in 1986. Eiko is a cult classic among those who either were there at the time and watched it contemporary, or historians like myself who are a glutton for pain and love to go back and dig up old dirt out the trash. Cause sometimes you may find jewels. Sixteen years following an extraterrestrial crashing in the planet that caused the population of six million to be wiped out, a new Graviton city has emerged. Our story opens up with this attractive red-haired girl's first day of school where she's running late. And we watch her get ready. Once her friend scoops her up and they head out, you notice how she's out of the ordinary with how fast she's able to run and how high she's jumping all over the place and through people's homes. Now, that first 30 or 40 minutes or so made me question why people talk so much about Project Eiko when it comes to classic anime. Actually, when Discotech first announced the Blu-ray remasters a couple years ago, I never understood the uproar of joy from the community. It seemed pretty generic to me. It was hella boring, it's kinda stupid, I'm talking about that first 20-30 minutes. But once things started to unravel, and I got to see why exactly they made this thing, the appeal of Eiko herself and her abilities, it all made sense. I appreciated the progression of action throughout the film, as the more and more you watch, the more the envelope gets pushed. When time came for Eiko to save her friend and she showcased herself as a fighter, you're exposed to her true nature. Most of the anime's value lies in the last 20 minutes or so, when the adventure goes airborne and Eiko and Biko fight and dodge the tanks and air missiles and all the madness in the sky. It was then when I comprehended the love for this anime. A lot of it probably is the juxtaposition of this little delicate looking schoolgirl being so aggressive and strong, able to handle her own against a grown axed warrior. It's hard to speak on plot when it comes to Project Eiko because it's clear as day that it never meant to put that as its best foot forward. I had to look up a specific explanation on Mao to really understand what's going on here because it's all over the place between the action, the character interactions, and of course the sci-fi political aspects. Remember in the beginning when I was talking about Eiko going to school and running around and this and that? I never really was able to follow it past that point. You start to get it later on though, when A and B and Seiko finally have to work together against this weird guy that's following them and the actual point starts to unravel. The show's weird though, with a lot of LGB getting in the mix. I feel like the movie suffers in a sense from being a mid-80s anime, where it feels dated to be watching right now at times. Very childish character interactions, generic comedy, in some instances this was pretty annoying. Yeah, and not much depth to the characters too. But all that said, it's not really supposed to be about any of that anyways, I guess. It's the moments when the action comes in when it really leaves its mark. And in the times of filler, leave you on your toes craving for the next time Eiko goes to work. I love it when she gets mad and just starts destroying everything in her path. Mechas, buildings, it doesn't matter. It's also one of these anime that's filled with Easter eggs of other anime at the time, like Captain Harlock, Creamy Mommy, and several others. Another thing that makes me think that the movie was never meant to be taken seriously. I do recommend this, but you have to bear through that first half hour or so. It really sucks, to me. Quite honestly, even some moments in between are not the greatest either. I did find enjoyable moments like when Biko was explaining that little mecha that she got at her aid, all the mechanics and stuff like that, and of course the action as a whole is over the top. The original VHS and DVD rips of this were nothing special, but now with the Blu-ray remasters, the film honestly looks amazing. There's some beautiful J-pop that plays throughout the film, and if you watch the English version, it's all been dubbed over or so I thought until I watched the behind the scenes documentary and found out the Japanese work with some English singers for the song. And just to speak on the behind the scenes for a second, it was a nice thing to watch to get more context of what the thought process was for creating this. There's an animator in here who mentions having a crush on Miss Ayumi, which gives me confirmation to my understanding of the possible driving factor for the deliberate sexualization of so many female characters in anime history. A lot of these dudes are horny, man. Yeah, I appreciated seeing the in-studio, the guy holding the New Type Magazine edition that first debuted Eiko, seeing all the women who voiced the various characters. Yeah, you probably want to watch this in addition to that movie, especially if you're a fan. One of the girls who sang the Dance Away song, I found her YouTube page. Her name is Samantha Newark, 
and she's a voice actress that I think did uh, that show Gem and some Transformers stuff back in the days. ターゲルトはちょっと違いますこの子たちがプロジェクト A この挿入歌を歌うことになったんでありますアメリカのキャンディーズいや少女隊以上ですキスをしておりますいい雰囲気和やか羨ましいあにゃ人いないわね近道するわよもしそうねー長見英子です皆さんよろしくお願いしますやっぱこれね、鉛筆をポキンと折れるところは、はい、その立管が、だからちょっと思いっきり力んでみてくれる、はい、あの、死ぬのよーっていう、この辺じゃなくて、もう少しこの辺、死ぬよー。近道するわよ。近道するわよ。近道するわよ。よし、それじゃあ。A year later, we got the second Project Echo movie, the plot of the Daitokuji Financial Group. The story for this focuses our lens over to Biko's family, specifically her father, who is a multi billionaire in the industrial sector. He partners up with another dude on some dirty politics tip, funding a project that's set to attack Napolipolita's ship. Obviously, not for nothing, there's some rare and special technology that would be beneficial to acquire out of there. It's set about three weeks after the end of the first movie. This one pretty much gives us more of the same. Eiko running around with Seiko on her arm and Biko trying to destroy her. But what stood out to me was how much more lovely the soundtrack was. It really brings in more of that city pop vibe with a little upgrade in visual production. I just really enjoyed this more for some reason. And this time around, the slice of life aspects in between all the explosions and stuff, it made more sense and it felt more fitting. I'm not mad about it feeling like a continued episode of what we got the previous year because I feel like it was a step further. I'd be lying if I said the action was better though, but it definitely still pulled its weight for that department. Leave me a comment if you agree or disagree, but I'm telling you, the second one carried a better energy and felt more polished, especially with how they individually handled the transition from the slow, playful beginning half into the dramatic episode for the second half. This is really measurable because they deliberately directed it in a somewhat identical format to the original, just adjusting it to the fact that there's a prequel movie viewers should have seen beforehand. Oh, and that song you've been hearing was the ending joint to the film.、Yeah. So, Cinderella Rhapsody, the third movie, carries a completely different energy from the first two. It's more serious. Not that much more serious, but more serious nonetheless. Funny enough, the plot is simply about A and B co chasing some handsome dude for the hour duration of the film. There's some other political stuff going on as well, but it's really focused on the whole lover girl triangle thing. I don't know why they chose to be weird with this, like the opening scene of them playing pool, which turned out to be a dream that had absolutely no relevance to what would come following. Anyways, overall, I have nothing much to say about this. It's definitely weaker than the first two movies, and I'm not quite sure why they made it. I guess, of course, to milk the franchise. <laughs> There are some attractive aesthetics that come from it being a couple years past the first movie, but that's pretty much as good as it got. Even the things that make Project Echo Project Echo take a sub priority position in this movie, like her physical abilities, and everything is about the interpersonal stuff. It's kind of weird. Final of the four core Project Echo movies is called Final, and I take this title to mean that all four movies can be looked at as a complete story representing their own OVA episode each. Sadly, plot wise, that's just not the case. Which is fine, because really, each one is its own individual film. And was intended to be consumed and digested that way. But what I said before is just food for thought. Apparently, there's a strange race emerging based on discoveries found by some archaeologists out in Iraq. In the opening scene, you'll think a lot of this, but of course, it ultimately means absolutely nothing because the writer is still throwing the desperation triangle between Aiko, Biko, and K in our face. And now, with him being engaged to Miss Ayumi, The recurring teacher of the franchise, whose art style in movie one is a parody of Creamy Mommy, popular magical girl from this era, things only get more heated. Movie four brings the aggressiveness back into the series as far as Aiko and Biko and how they battle, but it's no better or no worse in overall experience from movie three. That's for the Project Aiko fans' perspective, but for Rekka's perspective, 
I thought this was a beautiful movie and it's actually my favorite out of all four. Nothing really beats the last 20 minutes of the first movie, but as far as overall experience goes, I just think Project Echo Final benefited from the year it came out in, being 1989. Probably where technology had advanced compared to 1985 at that time and having enough leverage as an established series to pump money into it, coming together to make this happen the right way. Commercially, this may not reflect what I'm talking about, but as someone who just likes to enjoy an anime, this is the way I see it. The art and animation, it's at its peak. Well, maybe not so much the animation as it's been pretty consistent from the first movie, especially from 2 to 4, but character design-wise, I think things were maxed out. The Project Aiko franchise is looked back on as pretty much a 80s staple, but there was one more offering that came out back in 1990. Gray side versus blue side, or is it blue versus gray? Either way, I didn't really feel much from this. It definitely has that generic 90s fantasy OVA aura about it that obviously has its audience, but if you want something more deeper or even just something that's unique like how the original Eiko movie was, you probably won't get it out of this. It is the last Project Eiko animation and is completely standalone from any of the other previous movies. In this one, it almost takes on the dirty pair formula, where Eiko and Biko are not only close friends, as opposed to arch rivals, but partnered monster hunters. Seiko is in this of course, but this time she's usually occupied either being captivated by a sorceress or asleep or whatever. What they did with the Versus OVAs reminds me of Tenchi, where they'll grab a bunch of familiar characters from a franchise and remix the plot and themes into a completely unrelated and original continuity. Only difference, Eiko just did it once, so it just feels kinda random and out the blue. Fun facts, on February 1st, 1997, this aired on the Sci-Fi Channel in America. Lastly, if you ever see something called Project Echo Uncivil Wars, that's referring to this OVA. And the final and quick fact man for Project Echo, in whatever year it was I couldn't find it, a game actually came out on the PC-88 called Project Echo. It never really had much exposure or marketing and a lot of fans of the franchise, even back then, are shocked today to find out that it actually existed. Yeah man, the Project Echo franchise. I got mixed emotions. If we're being objective here, this isn't legendary stuff we've gone over today. I wasn't mad, but I know I wasn't crazy to feel indifferent to it when I discovered that the creator, Katsuhiko Nishijima, took the original project on because he needed the funds to replace his missing teeth. Like the video? Comment down below what y'all want to see next. I'm out. Thanks for watching. Anime back when.